This is uh, my first address as diocesan bishop. And as I said at the beginning of this, um, our time together, I really am absolutely thrilled to be here. Now, 10 months in, it hasn't gotten any worse. It's still going incredibly well. And I'm just as pleased as I can be. If you've seen me walking around in a suit, you may have noticed that I'm wearing a rather unusual name tag. It's actually from the Church of the Holy Spirit in Apopka, where I was a recent judge at their annual chili cook-off. <laughs> a more seriously competitive competition I have not witnessed since my consecration. <laughs> the name tag reads Holy Spirit Bandito, along with a bright red chili pepper. I was happy to receive it because, yeah, I am a chili head. I like the spicy stuff. And I guess if you have to be called a bandito, which means outlaw, then I guess a Holy Spirit bandito is the best kind. <laughs> it was not unusual for me to be a part of a chili cook-off. My wife and I love these sorts of events. I attended another chili cook-off at Good Shepherd Maitland. My wife and I attended a dance at, Good, at Shepherd in the Hills Lacanto, a 50th anniversary lunch for Augie and Shirley Servillo at St. Mary's Daytona. My wife and I are hosting a series of dinner parties for clergy and spouses, as well as a big pulled pork lunch for all the deacons. In fact, so far, 200 people have been through our house since we moved in last February. As I said in my consecration, and I'm making good, of, good on it, I want to be a part of a diocese that eats and laughs together. Last night's podium was another amazing example. Thank you for all of those who helped us have together. Why are these important? It's because it's at these occasions that we were actually able to build relationships across parish lines. We get to know one another. Over the past 10 months since my consecration as bishop, my wife and I together, because we're always together at these things, have made over a, li a little over 90 congregational visits in our diocese. Now, not all of those visits have been Sunday mornings, but not that many Sundays, and there's still so many people that we don't yet know. But some of them have been dinners, Q&A session with a youth confirmation class, one time at All Saints Winter Park, a youth service at Ascension Orlando, an ECW lunch at the cathedral uh, for the, or a Daughters of the King gathering in St. James Leesburg, Building dedications at All Saints Lakeland and St. Augustine of Canterbury, Vero Beach. Several vestry meetings, meeting with parochial and diocesan school boards. My Episcopal visits, which we enjoy, we, I mean, we really enjoy, have often included overnight stays, dinner, see more food, with rectors and spouses, being present for the early service as well as the main service, hanging out at receptions and lunches after the church is over, just to enjoy each other's company. Actually, just a different way of doing the church. We are having a great time. As Joe Toma says, who often attends and records the sermons, it's like a party every weekend. <laughs> and um, I, I have the bill to show for it to us. <laughs> I've logged in significant hours of pastoral care, especially for our clergy, who continue to be my top pastoral priority. When I can, I show up at the hospital, make the phone call. When one of our clergy is sick or in trouble, my clergy have my personal cell phone and they use it. I'm on Facebook and Twitter. People text me. Why am I making this kind of investment in time and energy? Because you, the people of the Diocese of Central Florida, are my diocesan family. That's, that's how I view us. And I hope you view us the very same way. This is not my job. This is my vocation. When I left the Diocese of Central Florida some 20-something years ago, the memories of the diocese that stayed with me were of a large, diverse group of congregations and leaders that found ways to work together for the sake of the gospel. Curcio closed closings that packed out St. Michael's Church. Clergy conferences at Camp Wingman lasting several days with time enough to put our feet in the lake and just joke together. We knew each other, we cared for each other, whether we were always in theological, in theological agreement or not. In fact, I would dare say that our theological disagreements back then were deeper than they are now. But we still knew each other, prayed for each other, cared for each other, wrestled with our theological differences. We didn't smother them over. We really had very frank conversations. And all of that 
a part of the joy of really being a part of this Diocese of Central Florida. After arriving after the election, or I should say returning, I began to meet with the diocese instead, and it was clear that what they wanted was that same sense of family, and so we began. The entire leadership structure of the diocese has bent over backwards to make me and my family feel amazingly welcomed. Special words of appreciation should go to Archdeacon Christy Alday, Sid Glenn, and their team of outstanding volunteers who made the service of ordination and consecration a joyful time I will treasure for the rest of my life. In fact, I want to show you a shot. Where is it? There she is. <laughs> consecration, uh, I gave out some thank you gifts, and I couldn't think of a better one to give Christy a Wonder Woman doll, and it's the real thing. <laughs> I'm especially indebted, too, to the Diocesan Board Standing Committee and the Transition Committee who have worked extremely hard both to allow me to get my footing and for us to continue to find a way to move forward together. It was awkward at times. It felt something like showing up at the high school dance and feeling slightly nervous. But all of us wanted to join in, and we did. Thank you, diocesan leaders, for your patience, prayers, and hard work for this still new, very new bishop. I'm very happy to report to you that good things are happening in the Diocese of Central Florida. Many of our congregations are places of deep pastoral care and spiritual growth. Jim Sorvillo, now leading the Episcopal Counseling Center, is doing a fine job of reorganizing and revisioning that much-needed ministry in our diocese. Our diocesan budget ended with over a $77,000 surplus, and you recently donated over $30,000 to Hurricane Sandy Relief. I would also like to particularly express my gratitude to three clergy in this diocese. They don't know that I'm going to do it, but don't worry, they are no silly gifts. Um, one is Canon Ernie Bennett, the other is Canon Nelson Pinder, and the third is Father Jim Spencer. These three clergy have been wise in their counsel, unfailing in their support, free with their laughter, and gracious in their prayers. In short, I trust them. Do we always agree? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> but, but we love Jesus, and we know that about each other, and we are committed to, committing to serving Him together. Those relationships, along with many others, I now consider colleagues and friends, are something I see multiplying in the life of this diocese. Continuing to grow in trust and in friendship is extraordinarily important because that will be what allows us the relational breathing room to think about how we do mission together. And I'm thrilled to see that occurring. Doing mission together First of all, however, makes, a, makes requires that we make it a priority to recruit, educate, and raise up new leaders, both lay and ordained. I am grateful for the good work done at the Institute for Christian Studies and encourage you to make the time to take advantage of their excellent offerings. I want to see Crucio revamped and revitalized to raise up new lay apostles who see their communities as a mission field. Father Edward Weiss, as well as the very faithful Commission on Ministry, have joined me in helping establish new standards for discernment and training for those seeking ordination. Why is this so important? Because many of our present clergy and lay leaders are moving into retirement. Some are moving away. Some are less available. Even as the population in our diocese increases, presently we are not raising up leaders who are adequately equipped to meet the challenges of the present population in Central Florida, much less our growing future. To put it clearly, we do not have the necessary number right now of lay leaders and clergy to replace those who are retiring, and we must find a way to recruit and adequately train a new generation, especially of clergy, but not only them, to serve our present congregations as well as the future ones that we will plant together we need to be reaching the newcomers in our area, people coming from literally all over the United States, around the world, and most especially to reach those who do not know Christ. I am especially concerned with the raising up of the clergy to that end, and starting with the offering taken up at the Eucharist this morning, 
I'm establishing a new fund. I mentioned this earlier, called the Timothy Found, Found Fund, founded today on the Feast of St. Timothy and Titus. The key verse that defines the vision for the fund is 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by Him, a worker, who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. The purpose of the fund would be specifically to underwrite residential theological training for those seeking ordination to the priesthood. It has become clear to me that local option theological training is inadequate when it comes to providing high-quality Anglican theological education. Distinctive Anglican formation is missing for the options that are available to us. Plus, there is no adequate substitute for living, however briefly, in a residential seminary community. That experience of study, chapel, fellowship, and mission with others who share your passion for mission and your passion for Jesus within an Anglican and Episcopal context marks you in a way that other forms of seminary education cannot. However, when I require as bishop a component of residential training as a part of preparation for ordination to the priesthood, I am keenly aware that I am imposing a serious financial and emotional burden. Frankly, it is unfair to make that requirement without significant financial support. One year away in seminary averages for a family about $30,000 in tuition, books, and living expenses. Slightly less or more, depending on where you go or whether you're married or single. While that is a steep price, it is not out of line with the cost of residential education. And frankly, there are no adequate options. To make this fund workable in the long term requires that we receive enough funding to build up a cash reserve capable of helping us underwrite these expenses. Presently, our funding of seminarians is minimal, but it's the best we can do. We offer $2,500 per semester, which covers books and some costs of fee and fees and tuitions. That's not enough. We particularly, stepping aside, not many of our young adults now bear significant loans for their undergraduate education. That may not have been true for many of us when we moved to college, but it's the reality now. And to ask them when they already owe tens of thousands of dollars for their undergraduate degree to turn around and just add to that burden really limits their ability to be able to accept especially short, especially missionary callings because they don't pay what one needs to be able to fund their loans. We cannot put them in that situation, especially where the missionary edges are the places where we need to be putting these clergy. So, to make this fund workable in the long term requires that we need significant funding. We need to build up a cash reserve able to help us both invest and underwrite these expenses. If you were looking for a place to put the resources God has given you that will make a difference here for the sake of Christ, I urge you to consider the Timothy Fund. We need these funds to help these candidates get the quality education they need to be the clergy that we need. Help us raise up these clergy for Central Florida. Please pray for this fund's success. New populations are moving into our diocese and they are more internationally diverse than previous generations. Those who are moving here are this combination of college students and people wanting additional education, young workers looking for jobs in the growing industries in our area, business transfers, and a host of retirees. Some speak English, some speak little English. That is why this year both my wife and I are learning Spanish, including a three-week language, language school intensive in our companion diocese of Honduras. Many of our congregations are not reaching these neighbors, but instead limiting themselves to pastorally serving their own parishioners and those who have the gumption to go and visit that local church. There are some ex outstanding exceptions of churches that are growing and reaching their neighborhoods, but there are plenty of churches in this diocese have no, who have no plans to reach out to their neighbors unless they show up on Sunday morning. Given the rising number of Americans with no religious affiliation, that is the fastest growing demographic, um, and the steady decline in church attendance in all age groups, that is inadequate leadership. Unless we want to be as invisible in our neighborhoods, 
if you watch the show, as the parish church is in Downton Abbey. Notice the building is there, but none of those characters go to church. Our congregations need to criti critically assess the influence that they have and do not have, not just among their parishioners, but in their neighborhoods. We need to be asking God about what it means to be salt, light, a city set on a hill that cannot be in. We need to read, we need to think parish, a geographic region, not just congregation. That's not true to our heritage, and I really want to let that one go. We need to be parish churches, not just congregations who are outposts. Questions to ask. Are there populations in our immediate neighborhoods who are not represented in our worshiping congregation? Does your church fit your neighborhood demographic? If not, how can you reach them? Who is coming to Christ through the programs and witnesses of your members? Are there adult baptisms or just children? Is God healing marriages? Are lives being restored? Are people learning the Bible and how to apply its teaching to their lives? Are single people finding a home with us as well as married couples? Are children and young people being catechized in the gospel? Are the least of these in our community being served with the compassion of Christ? Do any of us even know who the least of these are in our community? Remember when the Apostle Paul reported to the congregation in Galatia on his meeting with the, Jew, with the Jerusalem Apostle, to whom he was accountable, by the way, he said, and this is quoting in Galatians, all these apostles ask is that we continue to remember the poor, something I was eager to do. A missionary strategy is the fruit of a hunger to be a part of something that actually matters, that makes an eternal difference in the lives of others. Because it is for this purpose that we were baptized into Christ, not just for our salvation, but for His glory. A missionary strategy asks the best of us and our resources. It humbles us, challenges us, changes us for the better. Changes us, as the scripture says, from one degree of glory to another. Do you really want to grow in Christ? Then ask God to change your heart and make you his missionary. And then watch out. As your bishop sees things, no congregation in this diocese can afford the absence of a prayerfully discerned, well-planned, and measurable missionary strategy. Quite frankly, it's so wonderful to be a part of what God is doing. Why would you want to miss out? I want our diocese to re-examine our missionary call. To that end, three events are planned in the first part of 2013. The first is an overnight retreat on February 8th and 9th. This is the reason for the best questions that you have received. That information that we collect will be used at that overnight retreat. Current and recently retired diocesan board members, current and recently retired standing committee members, and a number of our diocesan staff will gather at Canterbury. This will be a meeting for prayer, discernment, and planning. My hope is that we will get some idea of where God is taking us, but the us is all the congregations in this room. So your input as well as your intercessory prayer support is vital. The second is the upcoming visit of our presiding bishop. On March, March 2nd through 6th of this year, the presiding bishop is visiting the Diocese of Central Florida for the first time. As many of you know, initially she wanted to come and preside at my consecration. I knew, however, that if she came and presided, her presence would not be a point of unity, but a point of division. And I did not want my consecration to be a point of division, but rather of unity. I sat down and met with her at the, her office at the Episcopal Church headquarters shortly after my election and explained all of that to her and said, it's not that I don't want you to come, but please do not come to my consecration. She graciously agreed because she did not want that division to happen either. And so she didn't come. But long, not too long after I arrived, this date in March was set. Now what are we gonna do? She will be visiting several congregations in our diocese over a brief three-day period. On the morning of the fourth and last day, and those have already been parceled out. She will be meeting with our clergy at Canterbury. Why are we doing this? 
Two reasons. One, my hope is that we will be a witness to her that the Diocese of Central Florida is alive and well and the gospel works. We want her to know that we are staying within the Episcopal Church and, at the same time, are actively witnessing to the power of the gospel. We want her to know, number two, that we are not opting out. As some people have said, I'm not threatening to leave, I'm threatening to stay. <laughs> Her is a part of our missionary strategy because there are plenty of people in Central Florida who would engage in this conversation in a very different manner than we might and they need to know as much as anyone what it is that God is doing in our midst. The third event is a one day meeting with me for clergy in charge of congregations. That will take place after Easter, April 17th. We will gather at Canterbury to hear from one another, for us to talk together, for me to share the results of our discernment and planning meeting that we will have had earlier in the year. I want to solicit their input and reactions as to what steps God is taking us. We, as congregational leaders, will gather together to take counsel for the Diocese of Central Florida. In summary, number one, what's the commitment? We are strengthening our relationships with one another becoming more deeply a diocesan family. Number two, we are raising up new leaders and are committed to doing so both with time as well as with finances, both for clergy and laity. We are looking at our neighborhoods and facing the missionary challenge that is before us. We are taking our place, number four, within the councils of the Episcopal Church. And number five, we are moving in this early part of 2013 into a time of discernment, praying and asking God for his leadership, his missionary strategy. Because I want to say to you that if Jesus isn't there, I don't want to do that. And there's plenty in the church, as our preacher rightly alluded, that could cause that to happen. So, I, I really believe that this year, somebody came up to me this morning and said, oh, it's a new beginning. And it is. I really believe that God has placed before us an extraordinary opportunity. I really deeply believe in the joy of joining together in His service. So, family, let's get out there. Yeah.